Yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Morgan Pell. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Grit. Uh, and we help companies put their software maintenance on autopilot. So what do we mean by that? Uh, you've obviously seen GitHub Copilot, I hope, right? And it's all these tools that really help you build new code. And there's impressive demos all the time that help you build new applications. But only a small percentage of the code in the world is brand new code, right? The vast majority of every transaction you do, every uh, everything you buy, every airline you take is all code that was already written often many, many years ago, but it's incredibly important. And that's everything that Grit focuses on is everything that's below the iceberg, right? Everything that's the maintenance and migrations and modification of existing code, right? Um, overall, developers spend about a third of time on modifying code, right? Technical debt tasks of cleaning things up, uh, doing migrations, doing these really boring things that are necessary, upgrading a, a library because there's new vulnerability in it, modifying things. Uh, that's definitely not why I got into software engineering, right? I wanted to build cool new things, not upgrade my React version because there's a security vulnerability, but it needs to happen, right? And that's what Grit does. Right? We take care of the uh, upgrades and maintenance activity, all the stuff that's the least interesting part of software engineering. So i going to go ahead and just show you a demo of how that actually works. So what we have with Grit is a really easy way to ingest and understand an entire code base and make modifications across the code base, right? So instead of uh, what, how you traditionally use software engineering, which is open your ID, look at one file at a time, modify that file, with Grit, we actually modify the entire repository at once, right? And can we do that with queries here? It's actually a query on the AST structure. So the way, same way the compiler understands the program, uh, Grit QL, which is our query language, can also understand the program. So we can do things like uh, pretty simple things, like you know adding types to all of our errors or uh, converting all of our tests from chai to jest, right? These are two different JavaScript testing frameworks. Or doing things, uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, converting uh, React components, upping them from class components, which is the older style, all their functional components, which ends up basically rewriting the entire file, right? And this is sort of the changes that you do. All these are semantically correct because we're not just uh, making the change, we're actually validating on the compiler level. We understand it on the same way that the compiler does with the abstract syntax tree, so we can actually make these changes in a guaranteed correct way, right? Uh, so this is just a demo of uh, you know one file, but it's much more interesting once I go and look at my entire code base. So if I want to go over here, I'd my demo shop. This is going to query across the whole, whole code base, find anything that needs to be changed, show me all the files that need to be changed, and let me create a pull request right from there. And I can also on the fly choose new things I want to do. So let's say I want to find everywhere that I'm just using console.log. I'm a classic like printf debugging person, never learned how to use a debugger. I just do console.log everywhere, right? Here's everywhere in my, code, in my code base. Now, let's say I want to stop using console.log and I want to start using uh, Winston. So Winston's a popular Node.js logging library. I want to use that. It's got log levels, so it's going to be nice. It's going to look at the message and understand what the right log level is. So I can just say with, with grit, convert this into a guess here. And let me just give a quick instruction. Uh, use Winston. And that's going to go find everywhere in my code base that I have these. Uh, if I say instruction instead of instruct, and it's actually going to go analyze each of these, feed every single one through a language model, convert it, and then feed it out through the out output. All right, so now I have a diff where I've seen that's going to use Winston.debug there, which is a good choice, right? It's a debug message. It's going to do Winston.error here because that's supposedly an error. Error here. It's going to use Winston log. About preserving all the outer context around all these, right? This is obviously a pretty quick demo, but you can take the same concept and scale it up to really large repositories where we could actually be looking at millions of lines of code that would typically take six months to do a change like this of adopting a new framework or converting from JavaScript to TypeScript. We actually helped one person here, uh, prompt layer that demoed earlier, convert their code base over to TypeScript. Uh, and we can actually scale this enti entire technique up uh, into something that would typically take six months do it in a day or two, right? There's a massive savings in how hard it is to do these things. And we can see actually that the results of one of these, if we go over here to migration, where it's actually doing this large convert JavaScript to TypeScript, where you can see the steps that it went through, right? It went through uh, cloning the repository, initializing TypeScript, installing dependencies, all the things that a developer would have to do to get set up. Uh, the AI agent also has to do to get set up. So it figures out, reads the readme, figures out what it needs to do, install to get running, reads through all the dependencies, reads any docs that you have, uses all that as reference to autonomously start making these changes, and then goes into the transforms. And then my favorite step actually here is this last step, the healing step, where it actually runs the unit tests, runs the compiler tests, and then takes that as input into what it needs to modify, right? So it actually makes sure that even if the first version is not correct, 
the 15th version might be, right? So actually continuously run, uh, this is where a lot of our engineering effort goes into making uh, these like good changes run is be, being able to have that recursive loop where we make a change, validate that's correct. If it's incorrect, continue to iterate on it. That's just a quick demo of how grit works. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about actually uh, what has gone into making that work, right? So, uh, so the grit agent is what powers the autopilot that I showed there with doing these migrations. And this is an autonomous system that we developed that just we give an objective, right? We can give it the high level objective of converting JavaScript to TypeScript. Uh, and it combines the language model reasoning. So we use GPT-4 as our kernel. Uh, we've got a lot of other language models that we've built on top of, but GPT-4 is the strongest reasoner today. And then takes lots of different actions with code modification, doing searches, uh, walking the language server, walking the ASC to make modifications, and then take options and modifi modifications on those, right? Uh, this is a fun little thing. If you do a naive version, it's just going to run in circles forever. It's not going to make any progress. This is a uh, good demo of like what it looks like if you don't give it the right set of tools and the right guardrails, right? Uh, and the biggest thing that we are able to do is constraining the domain. Uh, you might have heard of the React framework, which is basically you do chain of thought. You say, here's what we're trying to do. Uh, you have it, it thinks about what it should do next, right? Its, its goal is to convert JavaScript to TypeScript. It maybe has seen one error and it's going to decide, all right, I should try to fix this single error. Right? It takes an action, which is going to be some input, like say modify or patch that file, or run the TypeScript compiler to get additional info, or maybe even do like a definition lookup. Right? We give it all the same tools that a developer has in their IDE. Right? You can still do hover hints, you can still run tests, you can still uh, go to definition, all these sorts of things. It does those. And then once it has an observation, it comes back from the outside world, the outside environment, like uh, maybe the compiler had feedback, it can continue to do this loop until it is successful. Uh, one of the other things that's really important for how we're able to do this is by staying on distribution with what's the kind of thing that you're trying to solve. Uh, so, you know, with some, some cases, Markdown works really well, right? If the kind of stuff that you're trying to look at is stuff that's traditionally in a readme, right, in a readme file, there's been tons and tons of readmes uh, on GitHub that have been trained in every foundation model, right? And we, by looking at that, we can do things like the steps, for example, all of our step input of parsing of what the right dependencies to install, we do that in Markdown because that's the most reliable because that's the most similar to what we see in the actual distribution in the wild. Uh, whereas if we were trying to figure out uh, commands to run, right, commands actually what's nat most native for us is shell, right? We actually give the language model a uh, fake shell, right? We're not actually running everything into the shell. We're just giving it the that as the parsing format because it's able to intuit what's the what's the right commands because it's seen many, many cases of people, run, developers running shell commands in a distribution data set, right? Uh, they're evaluating progress, infrastructure still matters, right? We've actually done most of our engineering here on the infrastructure side uh, by doing compiler engineering to make sure that we have all the language model feedback, doing lots of stuff like spinning up micro VMs in milliseconds uh, because we want to be able to sandbox everything that we're executing if we're executing untrusted code. We need to do that in a sandbox that's really ephemeral. Uh, have unit integration tests running. And then of course, uh, we also have judge models. So we've got some models that will actually look at the output, verify if that's valid or if it's sensible output, and if it's not sensible output, uh, go on and, and uh, revert back, right? This is how it gets modeled over time. And of course, some human reviews. We don't yet push code straight to production without human review. Uh, there's always a developer at the end of the day approving the pull request that's gonna go into production. So. And of course, the most powerful tool that we have is the uh, language, is the great QL language. Uh, you know, I can famously say, you know, don't try to get an LM to do complicated math, give it a calculator. Uh, so for us, that's the great QL, which allows us to do things like find every time we're referencing the console in our code base. Uh, this is just a sample great QL query uh, that we take in as a very simple construct that you know the language model can very easily generate. That's in, that one line query. We compile it down to this whole expression actually that's going to walk the the AST, uh, find the walk the whole graph, find the changes that need to be made, and then is able to find all these matches. And you'll see there's a few different ways that this is matching. Uh, obviously, it matches a basic console.log. Uh, but it will also match a constant log that's spread across multiple lines, right? Because even though that syntactically looks different, right? It has different textual matching. If you're just doing pure textual match, it wouldn't match. Uh, but if you're doing uh, the ASC structure, it's identical. Uh, but the coolest one is it'll even work if you've redefined your variables, right? You can see this third example here where we redefined logger as console, right? So you try to kind of trick it a little bit. Uh, but still, because it knows the underlying value is the same, we, I don't know if we're still re referencing console, that third one where we're referencing logger.log is still going to match that because it knows logger was originally console, right? So this is where having the actual compiler understanding is really valuable. Cool. So those are some of the tools we use for GitQL. I uh, just wanted to give a quick demo of how this works, but happy to take any questions and go from there. Uh, 
uh, what are some of the like future languages that you're looking to support with this? And have you considered any like legacy uh, languages to help people kind of convert to newer formats? Yeah, uh, we're planning to support every major programming language by the end of the year. Uh, we're launching uh, pretty much a new language every month. Uh, we've had some customers ask us for a COBOL. Uh, we're talking to them about it. Uh, that's gonna have to, someone's gonna have to pay me a lot of money to start working with COBOL, but we'll, we'll open up the possibility. Uh, and then anything that's newer than that, we're planning to have pretty robust support for. So anything Ruby, uh, C sharp, anything there, we're gonna we're so we're planning to support pretty soon. Hi, um, this is a two part question. One is, um, what are the biggest challenges you're seeing, you know, um, in your uh, current uh, roadmap? And second, um, you mentioned you, you know you can do transform like from one language to another. But uh, also, like sometimes we have li libraries which get deprecated, um, and then you know you need to update to the new libraries. Yeah. Is there something you know you're working on that as well? Yeah. Uh, so the biggest challenge question uh, to start. Uh, biggest challenge is just knowing whether we've done things correctly, right? Uh, if we have a compiler, of course that helps. If you're using a statically checked uh, static types, that helps. Uh, anything where we can have more info in there, and then, of course, unit tests help a lot. Unfortunately, some of the legacy code bases we look at have none of these things, right? They don't have static types. They don't have any unit test to speak of. Their only review process traditionally has been push it out and uh, fix it when somebody complains. Uh, so that we have to, in some cases, actually auto-generate uh, a set of unit tests on the existing code before we even make any modifications, and then use that use those unit tests that we've generated as our uh, validation set as we're making changes. Um, it, there's still lots of work, of work to do. That's the biggest thing that's top of mind for me, though, is how we, how we function in these code bases that are really not high quality, but need to be high quality. Uh, in terms of uh, what's the second, what's the second part? Uh, libraries. libraries, yes, uh, yeah, that's one of the primary use cases for Grit. Was uh, anytime you've got a library upgrade, you need to go from an older version of Angular, old version of React. You've got uh, you know some old Django version, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, Grit can really help with that because we've seen lots of cases. We actually can see everyone in open source who's done that same kind of upgrade before. Uh, there's no reason for you to do the same upgrade that you know. A million other people, other developers have done. We just are constantly scanning and ingesting all those upgrades that have been done uh, through pull requests that are happening on open source repos, and then we play the results into the code base. I'm not so sure how. To oh, there we go. Uh, first off, this is truly like amazing technology, man. Um, so, if I understand correctly, you're basically taking people's existing code, building some intermediate representation, which you mentioned is like GritQL. And then from that, you're able to like resynthesize new code with like transformations applied to the IR itself. Is that correct? Well, we apply the, we didn't invent the IR, uh, the intermediate representation for anyone who's not up to date on compiler lingo. Uh, we don't have use our own uh, intermediate representation. We use the underlying languages one. So if you're using JavaScript, we're still operating on the JavaScript uh, abstract syntax tree, uh, but we are operating on that level versus on just a pure syntactical level, which makes it much more robust to changes and stuff there. I see. Thank you. So my question is like, how would this translate to, um, well, modifying or updating uh, companies with rather le archaic legacy systems? Yeah, and that's our, that's our core business is helping companies that have uh, legacy systems that they know need to be modernized. Uh, like we work with customers where their code base they, have, they started writing it 20 years ago, right? And that's many of the code actually, like we will look at the files in Git blame and it literally hasn't been touched for many, many years. Uh, and it's because we can, uh, that's actually, there's really robust data on there. You know, if you, we GitHub's been around for a long time, people have done these migrations before, uh, we can pretty effectively do these kind of changes uh, over time. Uh, and that's, you know, there's, it's mostly, uh, it's mostly a matter of kind of going through the code base and doing all these thousand little steps, right? It's not anything where any particular part of the code base it's hard to migrate in most cases. It's just the sheer volume that's the biggest challenge and why most engineers don't want to sit down and uh, be stuck on that project of going through a code base and migrating it for years on end. Uh, but of course, the AI agent is very happy to spend all day working with legacy code. All right, one last one over there. Yes. Actually, thank you. Uh, in one of your previous slides, you had a list of steps. Um, I was just curious, like, which of the steps involve a human in the loop? Um, which one here? 
yeah. I, I guess the last step here, human reviews, right? So every change that we generate eventually becomes a pull request so that a developer can review. So uh, the unit and integration tests, all the updates that are made, a human would have to run and check all of that, right? Well, they, they check the final output, right? They don't have to check every unit test execution, right? Uh, like that, and it's that's what's critical is that, you know, we can be running in the background, running the unit tests again, make a change, you know, run the unit test again. It's not a very fast process, but it's just there in the background. Once it has a final result that it thinks is fully correct, uh, humans will just do that final pass of saying, yeah, this in fact is correct. It hasn't just, you know, fixed all the unit tests by deleting the whole code base, right? Uh, which fortunately it doesn't do, but uh, is the kind of thing that you'd be worried about. All right. Thank you so much, Morgan. This was great. Appreciate it. Thank you.